This episode, I'm joined by David Parekha and Dan Attrell. David Parekha is a Associate Professor of Classical Studies and Co-Director of Medieval Studies at the University of Waterloo, and is also the President of the Societist Magica. Dan Attrell is doing a PhD in Western Esotericism with a dissertation of on Apocalypticism and Platonism. In this episode, we discuss the infamous esoteric text, The Picatrix, which both Dan and David translated, alongside discussions on translation, black magic, esoteric esoteric history, and more. I would like to wish all my listeners, subscribers, and patrons a very Merry Christmas in this first of two Christmas specials, and I would also like to say a big thank you to all my paid patrons and subscribers for once again making all of this work possible. And if you would like to support Metics or you've enjoyed something that you've listened to this year or enjoyed something that I've produced this year, please think about supporting Emetics. It really does go a long way. Um, and if you'd like to join the community, all these links are in the description below. So have a very good Christmas um, in this first of two specials, the other one coming tomorrow on Christmas Eve. And I hope you enjoy. So I'm joined by Dan Atra and David Pareka. So thanks both of you to for for coming on just so we can distinguish your voices because this won't be video um dan thanks for coming on thanks for having me and david thanks for coming on thank you very much okay. uh james for having us on our show on your show <laughs> that's okay there we go now now we're sort of distinguished your voices are quite alike so it's actually quite quite tough we are going to be discussing uh picatrix uh or some people might call it the picatrix um but this is the magic in history version uh, published by who are the publishers? Pennsylvania State University Press. Uh, okay, uh, which is Picatrix, a medieval treatise on astral magic, um, translated with an introduction by Dana Trail and David Prucker. So you both were involved in the the translation process. Yes, very much so. It was uh, a, a team effort, and uh, I did the first very rough draft, and and Dan Englished it very ably and then we both went through the entire text several times together um and it was uh, a labor of love on both sides i think and uh it's a pleasure to have it done and out there mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh how how did it come about that it you know how did it how did it come about and how did it come about that it got picked up by magic and history because i've been trying to get some of the authors from this series on because the, this whole series of magic and history is Seriously impressive. So how did this, this come about? And this seems to be one of the really popular ones from this series as well. Well, I've known that uh, there's been a need for an English translation for this for, uh, for a long time. I think uh, John Michael Greer and Christopher Warnock both, uh, they started their project at the same time as I started translating, unknowingly one to the other. They finished theirs much sooner because of... Uh, my involvement in university administration in the meantime, it was a struggle to find the time to, to work on this. So it took several years. And as, along the way, Dan got on board as research assistant. And um, then his contribution became undeniable. And we are currently have become co-authors on it and quite rightly so. Uh, Dan also wrote the bulk of the introduction. Uh, so, you know, hats off. It's uh, thank you for your help, Dan. It's been amazing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, David, you're uh, in academia. Are you a lecturer or, or professor? I'm, uh, associ- I'm associate professor in classical studies at the University of Waterloo. I'm the medievalist in the in that department. So I'm teaching um, the post-classical world, but pre-modern. And uh, so that's been, and Latin has been my main focus, and it makes sense to be translating the Latin Picatrix rather than its Arabic original which uh, a colleague of ours in London is currently working on at the moment, Liana Saif. Oh, wow. And uh, D- Dan, tell us a little bit about yourself. What is, it, what is it you do? So right now I am one of David's uh, graduate students. Um, I'm doing my PhD at uh, the University of Waterloo in Western, Esoter- Western Esotericism. Uh, I'm writing a dissertation on... Uh, apocalypticism and Platonism and how these currents intertwine in the Renaissance and in kind of how people think about history. And 
um, the role that prophetic thinking and platonic philosophy have had in generating our maps of, of time, essentially. So that's what I'm working on right now. And then, uh, of course, I also do the, um, the Modern Hermeticist uh, podcast, I guess you could call it. Um, it's a, more of a collection of things like audiobooks and lectures and interviews. Um, so that's on YouTube. And yeah, so that's mostly what I do um, is uh, research and translation and uh, podcasting, much like you do. And uh, that's more or less what I'm about. Sounds good. Sounds good. I guess this question would be for both of you. I mean, I guess it's tough for any of us to really answer it correctly because it's completely within my bias as well. But it seems to me that there's a real resurgence within esotericism, specifically Western, Western esotericism. So do, do you two see that as well? Oh, certainly. Yeah, the success of the Magic and History series at, uh, at uh, Penn State Press is an indication that, that e it's even sort of uh, blowing into the sales on the academic side too. Uh, the, the scholarly society for the study of magic known as the Societas Magica it has been uh, going for 25 years and it's going strong. Um, so, so that it's happening both on the academic as well as on the practitioner, uh, practitioner side of, of Esoterica. Yeah, and I think also there's just a kind of world weariness with the new age that came about maybe in the 2000s when people started to become a little bit more skeptical um, about some of the ideas that were floating around in there. And they wanted to get a sense of how these ideas came about. What is the true chronology of these ideas? How do we think about these things in, in a historical framework um, as opposed to these you know, Im immemorial ideas that are disembodied and floating around in the realm of forms. Uh, so I think that it's it's been a, a, a lot of that. If you look at something like the work of Fauder Hanegraaff, um, who, if you can, you should try to get on your show. Uh, he's been, he, he, I think, launched his career looking at the New Age and the history of the New Age and then eventually got into studying Western esotericism and, and what is esotericism. And that's kind of spawned this whole Amsterdam school of thinking about esotericism as rejected knowledge, the, the detritus from the Enlightenment. And there are different... Uh, opinions about that you know what is is that really the best way of thinking about esotericism as this trash bin or should we be essentializing it and thinking of it as these collections of disparate currents like alchemy and, and astrology and um, black magic and so forth so yeah I think we have been getting a resurgence of of esotericism I think it's a really new field uh, all together and it's just sp spawned out of the great plurality of currents that were floating around in the 60s and the 70s mm -hmm. yeah i was going to say when you brought up the new age thing it does seem that a lot of people who were involved in you know are involved in new age stuff which i tend to really loathe uh either get bored of it and just go back to living normally because it doesn't really help them very much or you know they graduate and they they look they look a bit deeper and i'm thinking like greer always makes a joke out of it i'm sure greer will probably come up a lot in this in this interview group greer always makes a joke of Rhonda burns the the secret which had that sort of brief like oh, yeah. super popularity and then you you look into it and it's just sort of affirmations and positive yeah, new thinking thought. yeah new age thought clothed again in a different sort of garb like um, mary baker eddy repackaged <laughs> which is funny because like that's what tr fuels trump that kind of thinking yeah norman uh, norman vincent peel power of positive thinking it's exactly the same thing um but yeah it's always it's always there and it's always repackaged and it's but it's nice to see you know people actually interested in you go well hang on this has already been you know spoken about way way back by you know there's a million names for the same thing um but moving on from there, uh, this is the first time we have two guests on the show. 
uh, for the hermetics question. But so I think maybe what I'll do is say, uh, I'm sure you both know the question. You can place three thinkers, living or dead, into a room. Listen in on the conversation. Who would you pick? I think what we'll do is each of you pick your three, unless you've done three for both of you, but either way is fine. But if you both pick three, we'll have a eventually have a room of six and see what happens there. So maybe um start with Dan. Uh, who would your three three be? All right. So my question is, can can fictional characters be admitted? Well, the first time, one of the first times I ever did this question, uh, Nick Land put five hyperdimensional lemurs in the room. So I, at this point, anything goes. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> so I think that my three people would probably be uh, Jesus Christ, mm-hmm. Lao Tzu, mm-hmm. and... Conan the Barbarian. Okay. Because I think that that would really be the, the the kind of like holy trinity of antitheses. And I had the thought of, of uh, splitting the question into dead people and, and living people. On the dead side, we would have Frederick II Hohenstaufen, John D. and Giordano Bruno. Mm-hmm. And among the living people, it would be John Michael Greer, Dmitry Orlov, and uh, James Howard Bunsler. <laughs> okay. So with the first three from Dan, in what sense do you see them as sort of antitheses of each other? Well, I think like Conan and, and Jesus are really polar opposite ways of thinking, right? Um, that They have very different approaches to reality, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, one smashes and doesn't ask for forgiveness. The other one uh, only smashes righteously and is all about forgiveness. And and uh, they have very different ideas about you know love and compassion and what makes a thriving world. Um, and so these are kind of the you know they're the pagan and the and the Christian antitheses. Uh, they're just incommensurable ways of of looking at the world. And then we have Lao Tzu, who would essentially try to strike up a balance or, or see the tension at work in some sort of holistic fashion. And I'd be interested to see how that, uh, that plays itself out. Okay. And then, uh, David, you'll have to forgive me. So you had Bruno and... I, so I have Frederick the... Hohenstaufen. Mm -hmm. Frederick II, the the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, based in Sicily. We have John Dee and Giordano Bruno. Okay, okay. What's the all three? Sorry, all three of whom are their thinking is basically perpendicular to just about everyone else at their time, and having them all know, knowing also that they could actually all speak with each other, all of them knew Latin, uh, is is encouraging. So so they could actually realistically interact if they could all be put in the same room. And because they were, they're all their thinking is well off the beaten track of of their time period. Uh, I reckon that some interesting sparks might result. Mm-hmm. I think Bruno and, and Bruno I, would probably be the uh, the sort of outstanding one there, though, right? Oh, in terms of the character. perpendicularity, yes. Oh definitely. no, I mean in terms in terms of character. Oh yeah, yeah. Also, he's a very colorful individual. Managed to make enemies just about everywhere he went. Mm-hmm uh and and but and stubborn very to his own very much to his own detriment ultimately uh and and in that trio um uh d strikes me as the more tragic figure whose life's work kind of evaporated or slipped between his fingers as time went on uh despite being very high profile behind the scenes and at the elizabethan court and so on mm-hmm. and frederick Ohnstaufen is uh, just a remarkable character all around uh, in terms of, of practicing experimental science himself, writing treatises while ruling the Holy Roman Empire from Sicily, no less. He knew the wine was better, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. And, and your, yeah. your live room, is this just a fascination with collapse or why would you want Greer, Olaf and Kunstler? Oh, because their thinking is also perpendicular to what's going on in in everything you see in the mainstream at the moment. And uh, I know that at least two of them in, have been in the same room before. Uh, perhaps different pairs of them have been in the same room, but I don't think all three have been uh, in the same room. They, they have. I can, I can link you. It's an amazing 
super rare, like <laughs> two and a half hour conversation, uh, which is a video oh, of nice. with uh, Greer, Orlov, Kunstler, Chris Martinson. Oh, uh, wow. And uh, <laughs> one other collapse collapse expert and it's like the, the most interesting conversation i've ever listened to um it's fantastic i, I would really appreciate receiving that <laughs> i have to say because what i'm wishing for has apparently already happened and if chris martinson is part of the the, the team as well my goodness mm -hmm. <laughs> I I mean, and barbarian in there. exactly <laughs> um but if we were to think on the six so if we had lao tzu jesus and then um Bruno D and Frederick as well. Yeah. Is there anything you you two would sort of see in that dynamic? Well, probably a bunch of people would team up with Jesus from that group and they would uh, probably wage some kind of war against Conan the Barbarian. Uh, I'm pretty sure that Lao Tzu and Frederick would exchange uh, tactics and strategies. Um, oh, that's Sun Tzu. Oh, so I'm confused. Lao Tzu is the author Oops. of the Tao Te Ching, whereas mm. Sun Tzu is the author of the Art of War. <laughs> Fair enough. I sit corrected. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm sure that uh, of these nine figures, many uh, many will come back in. Um, but just to begin, um, where can we situate the Picatrix historically? Well, there are two phases we have to think about, uh, essentially. The first phase being in the 10th century during the time of its composition by uh, Maslama al Qurtubi. So, 954 uh, to 959 is when it was composed. And really, our story as translators of the Latin um, that begins in the mid 13th century. And that's around 1250, 1256 to 58, depending on what calculation of dates you want to use uh, because in the prologue to the Picatrix itself there's a paragraph describing the dates and if one tries to triangulate between those various date reckoning schemes one ends up with a two-year range in our uh, BC AD time reckoning 1256 to 58 is when the translation is said to claims it, itself to have been produced uh, from Arabic into Spanish Castilian Spanish at the court of Alfonso the Tenth, uh, Alfonso el Sabio, the Wise, and from there it gets translated into Latin shortly thereafter, but definitely by 1300 because some of the interpolations, the bits of text that are added into the Latin but are absent from the Arabic, uh, are present uh, were inserted approximately in 1300 in Montpellier, southern France. We, and which means that the Latin text has to have been already existing by then for these bits to be added. So as uh, as translators, do you think as it's had this sort of long lineage of translations being handed to different people, being translated by different people, do you think potentially that something's been been lost? Do we have the do we have the absolute original? Well, I mean, yes, we have various manuscripts in the Arabic, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, right now. Liana Saif is the one collecting those various manuscripts and creating a critical edition and translation. And so there are lots of various manuscripts floating around in the Arabic, and even those have differences among them. And so they have to be all reconciled into one giant critical edition. So really there is no um, archetypal pure, there never is pure text. Um, it, it's extremely rare, in fact, to find an author's autograph version. What, I'm, what I mean by autograph is the, the text written in the author's own hand, surviving from the Middle, from the middle Ages. There's a handful of Thomas Aquinas uh, that survives in that form. But as soon as you go prior to the year 1000 or so, uh, that's, uh, if there's any, I'm not aware of, of them. And so and the same applies to Arabic texts and the, the Arabic manuscripts of the Picatrix we have all post date the author's life by a fair bit. And the, in the, on, for the Latin version, the distance is even more extreme in that the earliest manuscripts we have of the Pic Latin Picatrix date to the 1450s, whereas the text itself is known to have been established by 1300. And in fact, there are very few, if any, uh, references to the Picatrix in Latin literature from 
the composition of the text until the 1450s. So it's like there's this 150 year gap of no acknowledgement of it, but the text has to have been around for copies to have been made in the 1450s. Right. And that's to say nothing of the fact that the Latin edition has a bunch of things added to it and a bunch of things removed from yeah. it in, yeah. in making it, you know, not a completely different work. There are, you know, significant portions of overlap. Yeah, it's recognizable as the same text, but it's different in very substantial ways. Yes. And one mustn't forget the Spanish intermediary between the two, which survives and only in very fragmentary form. There's only a handful of pages uh, that confirm that uh, it that it belongs as an intermediary step. Um, and one can infer from the surviving fragment of Spanish that uh, the Latin resembles the Spanish much more than it resembles the Arabic. Mm -hmm. So do we have any in inclination uh, as to the author or potential authors? Of the original Arabic or of the Latin, do you mean? Well, both. If, if, if I mean, in terms of who originally wrote it, do we have any inclination of that? So the uh, tr traditionally people have been ascribing this to one Maslama al Majriti in the 11th century, um, but uh, that's been proven by Mar Maribel Fierro to um, be incorrect. That's uh, that's actually an attribution that was began with Ibn Khaldun of all people. Um, but the true author is Maslama al Kurtubi. Yeah. And so the Cordoban, and he was known by his contemporaries as a man of many charms and talismans. Hmm. And he's a very mysterious figure. He, he um, was known as uh, what we can call uh, essentially a, a cultist, a botanist, somebody who deals in hidden matters. And he was a philosopher. Um, of, uh, ultimately, that's how he perceived himself uh, was as somebody who was doing natural philosophy. And there's some debate as to whether, uh, and some, some people call Al-Qurtubi uh, a compiler, others call him an author when it comes to the Hayat al-Hakim, which is the Arabic original called, the, it translates as the goal of the sage, which is the Arabic title of the Picatrix. Um, and I, I mean, he is compiling material from he said in the book itself says two from 224 different sources um but there are they're arranged in a very specific way that was that that betrays intent um on on the author on al kurtubi's part and my personal view is that i would drive sort of halfway between those two designations and call it a very carefully curated compilation and I, I'm still willing to call him an author because the curation justifies it. Yeah, and he's not just hodgepodge mixing stuff together. He's creating a very comprehensive system that is not self-evident from just reading cover to cover. You really have to have some sort of background or training in the various traditions that comprise uh, the various practices, especially astrology, right? There's yeah. a lot of... of a priori astrological knowledge that you need to have before you you come to the Picatrix. And the same with you know, arguably you know, alchemy and plant lore and yeah. these kind, maybe not alchemy, but uh, so, definitely a knowledge of metals and a knowledge of minerals and plants and so forth. Yeah, yeah the, the plants are a big thing. Uh, the al Qurtubi wrote a, a sibling volume to this uh, called the Rutbat al-Hakim, which is the rank of the sage and uh, just as the Picatrix deals with astral magic, uh, the Rutbat al-Hakim does the same for earth-based magic, i.e. alchemy. I suppose we should say right off the bat what the Picatrix is. Good point. For, for people who are familiar <laughs> with it. It is a, it is a magician's handbook, uh, an astral magician's handbook on how to perform astral magic, which is usually performed through the construction of talismans or images. So these can be figurines or statues or sigils, and they are 
made at the correct astrological hours under the right configurations of the planets. And these then pour down their influences, their rays or their spirits into these talismans. And uh, then they become essentially uh, repositories of that config of that snap snapshot of time and that can have power that can be then carried over into other times um and so really this was you know we think of this as magic but for them this was the height of philosophy this was this was employing all of the branches of the seven liberal arts and using them in order to affect change in the world uh, using science. I should uh, add the postscript that the Rutbat al-Hakim, the rank of the sage, the sister volume on alchemy, ha was never translated into Latin and so is broadly speaking unknown uh, in the West, unlike the Picatrix. Is there any plans to translate it? I don't know. Wait, one would have to create an edition of it. I don't think that the Rutbat al-Hakim has even seen print in Arabic. Wow. So, so and there's, there's, yeah, it's not the only book of its kind that uh, that hasn't seen print. I mean, there's a whole lot of scholarship that uh, that needs to be done on the Arabic Middle Ages, um, and so it's a rich, a rich field. It's a rich field. Um, I should mention, I guess, as well that there has the Arab, the Hayat al Hakim, the Arabic Picatrix, has seen print. Uh, in the late 20s and early 30s through work at the Warburg Institute, but they did not have access to all of the, um, to all the manuscripts uh, that are known to be extant of, uh, of the text. And so that's why Liana Saif has uh, felt the need to, to start working on it. And she, her work has progressed a fair bit at this point from what I gather. Oh yeah, it's almost done. It's just that new manuscripts keep popping up. And so every time a new manuscript pops up it's like oh i have to get to this place somehow to this collection somehow and and then compare everything i've written to this new manuscript so it's like i've got to reread the picatrix every single time a yeah. manuscript comes up and not just read it but really letter by letter yeah. scan it very cautiously yeah. um as far as our work is concerned with with um the Latin edition, that kind of critical edition work was done by David Pingree, who is a real legend in the field of astrology or the history of mathematics and astrology. And uh, I don't know if you have anything to say on David Pingree, but he's a fairly important figure in this whole story. Uh, and um, I mean, his work on Arabic mathematics and Arabic astrology is almost peripheral to his main task, which was the cataloging of Sanskrit astrological manuscripts uh, in India. And he would tell tales of, of his manuscript hunting expeditions in, in India uh, that are absolutely daunting as compared to even to the quantity of Latin manuscripts that survive. There's uh, two orders of magnitude more uh, in terms of quantity of Sanskrit stuff that is just sitting in libraries in India, um, un, unedited, unprinted, and and uh, the climate in India isn't um, auspicious for the long-term survival of these things because uh, from what David Pingry was telling me, the traditions of copying these manuscripts in the temples has so, sort of fallen by the wayside in the last couple of centuries. And the average lifetime, lifespan of a manuscript in India uh, in that climate is precisely a couple of centuries. So there's a lot of work, a mountain of work to be done there. Um, and uh, so anyone who is very good at reading Sanskrit manuscripts, there's, <laughs> they know if they, ha if they have that skill, they know how much work they have to do. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, you mentioned, just to jump back, you mentioned, you know, it's compiled from sort of 200 sources. Yeah, maybe, maybe I'm on the, the wrong track here, but are any of these sources, would they be familiar to anyone? Oh, definitely, definitely. Most of them are, and they span quite a wide range. I mean, Al Qurtubi, in his youth, uh, traveled a great deal across the Mediterranean. He was he was from Spain, but the Arab world encompassed the entire southern and eastern side of it. Um, uh, so his sources are um, 
Egyptian, they are Arabic, they are Babylonian, they are Persian, they are Indian, they are Nabataean, uh, in addition to being to, to the Greek material. Um, it appears as though the Latin world wasn't prominent enough at the time to justify any inclusion, it seems. There's very little uh, to do with the Latin world in, in this text. Um, so his extensive travels led him to collect all of these sources, and late in his life, apparently by the time he was already blind, he pulled together and presumably dictated uh, the Picatrix, as we see it, or the Hayat al-Hakim at the very least. So and, I think and he cites his own he cites his own sources most of the time. Um, yeah, like he he I think takes pride in the fact that he has used so many books, yeah. and he wants you to know that he read Ibn Washia, he read Ptolemy, he read you know uh, Abu Mashar, he read all kinds of different authors. Uh, yeah, Thabit ibn Qura, yeah. um, the Pseudo Aristotelian Hermetica, which is a very like a collection of works. So he he did want you to know that he was working from a tradition and from a, a real wide range of stuff, and and so that is how we can retrace essentially uh, what what he was doing. I mean, he he's pulling together an in, a fairly internally consistent system out of very disparate sources, all things considered, mm -hmm. uh, which is an impressive feat. And, and I guess in that sense, justifies the, the attribution of authorship to him. Right. But um, he didn't invent the system. No, so he certainly like, didn't. So there are, for example, if you read a, another work that was popular in the Arabic world called The Secret of Secrets, uh, which is uh, cited in the Picatrix, mm -hmm. and it is a dialogue between Alexander and Aristotle. And Aristotle is teaching Alexander all of these um, basically tips on how to rule a kingdom. But near the end of this, part of being this great ruler is the capacity to do magic. And so there is instruction on how to build certain talismans. And, uh, and that is essentially the same kind of magic that is appearing in the Picatrix. So when you say it's based on a traditions and there's a system, do you mean something other than sort of, you know, is there an affiliation there with, you know, say Hermeticism or Gnosticism? Are we are we dealing with one of these systems or did you mean something else entirely? It's really complicated. Yeah, yeah, so, it's it's at the intersection of the Neoplatonic hierarchy of being and how it's thought to work and Alkindi's theory of rays and how it was thought to work uh, and the whole theory of... of um, sympathetic correspondences between things is fits into this and it fits into the the system and it is it's never described in a in a way that would be satisfying to a modern sort of systematic thinker mm -hmm. uh, because you have to pull together bits and pieces from a whole bunch of different places to sort of imagine the coherent system that seems to lurk behind all of the the details as they're sprinkled throughout the picatrix yeah if i really had to simplify it and this is painfully simplifying it i would call it pseudo aristotelian but the problem is that using the term pseudo aristotelian uh it you don't do that to preclude platonism it includes platonism or at least platonism as received in the arabic world and so you know, there are Platonic currents, there are um, Aristotelian currents, there are Stoic currents, and then there are in indigenous Egyptian and Babylonian currents through Ibn Washia, for example. Um, and, and he's really drawing all of these different currents together and showing how uh, this is what the ancient sages used to do. Uh, that's really his guiding light is the ancient sages of India, the ancient sages of Babylon, the ancient sages of the Greek world. They really had a, a knowledge. They were perfected in their understanding and therefore they could perform astral magic w because they, they were just one with the active intellect, so to speak. So when, in relation to these sages, if when, when, when the Picatrix refers, refers to God, it would be referring to the God of these sages? So the God of, of the Hayat al-Hakim is very unambiguously Allah. Mm -hmm. It's the God of Islam. Um, 
and it once it moves over to Christianity, it becomes very clearly the Christian God, but no reference to the Holy Spirit or Christ. So there's no real Trinitarian rehashing over, which is somewhat surprising, I think. You know, there's like in the year of our Lord or references yeah. like that, but there's no reference to Jesus or any kind of Christian. Um, like there are some Christian edits. Yes. Uh, yes. The the Christianity or the Christian audience of the Picatrix um, manifests in terms of the bits of the Hayat al-Hakim that were cut out by its translators into Spanish and then Latin. <laughs> Those bits that were most uh, explicit about referring to uh, the Quran, for example, are the things that get excised. Yeah. Or there is one ritual which is meant, it's basically a date rape ritual yes. for summoning, a, a making a young girl come to your house and stay with you. Um, and, but in the Arabic version, it's a young boy. So the, there was some element of homosexuality that was okay in the Islamic world that did not sit well with, uh, with the Christian world at the time. Wow. Okay. That's like, it's pretty strange that the, 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 the ritual is still okay. We just have to change whether it's a boy or a girl. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The question of whether things are, is okay or not is a, is a whole other like can of worms because that's like every single person is a different, uh, has a different idea of what is okay. And even the people who think it's not okay, they might think, well, I can read it. I know how to read this without becoming corrupted by it, but other people should totally not read it. Yeah, mm -hmm. the, the, the references to, to secrecy and not letting this text fall into the wrong hands are repeated very frequently throughout the Picatrix. And it's not uncommon for this genre uh, of text of, of comp compiled magical rituals to have these kinds of warnings. Um, yeah. And the Picatrix itself is very careful to present itself as a work, as the culmination of the sciences and of philosophy rather than uh, um, a text that deserves a program. Uh, and yet when one looks into the rituals, some of them are in, are quite distasteful Yeah, as we've just discussed. Cause, cause on the one hand, you're theoretically dealing with these platonic celestial intelligences that are discussed in say the Timaeus mm -hmm. uh, and these in that form seem kind of neutered, but in reality, when these are hooked up with their, actual pagan god forms like saturn or um or mars or whatever they they uh, have sacrifices to them and they become um more uh colored by their their pagan coloring which within a christian and islamic context would be a, a bit problematic um but that's again it depends when we say problematic it's we're saying problematic to who and you know islam was never a hegemonic power in the time period of uh al-qurtubi so you can't there there are ways to fall through the cracks so to speak um and and avoid getting in trouble or perhaps that kind of uh magic was was not even really seen with that much distaste. It was practiced by doctors and physicians, and it really depends. What comes about in the Christian world, especially, is a distinction between the good magic and the bad magic. Mm -hmm. So even the Picatrix, in, let's say Ficino, um, splits Picatrix up and says, look, we have the good stuff, which is the making gold talismans to cure your kidney stones. Kidney stones. Uh, we have Saturnine, Saturnine life extension rings, things like this. This is, this is good. This is medicine. Um, but there are rituals in the Picatrix where we have to summon the spirits of Saturn and we have to do sacrifices to them by killing animals and burning certain incenses at the correct astrological hours. And in this, we're certainly doing idolatrous and abominable behavior from the perspective of a medieval mendicant monk or, or priest or something like that. Another sign of the 
the hazards associated with a Picatrix is that um, it w it never saw print until the 20th century. Uh, and yet 17 or so complete manuscripts survive of it from roughly 1450 to 16 something. Uh, so it was popular enough to be copied multiple times, but no one wanted to associate their name with it in terms of a printed edition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we know many people Cornelius Agrippa, Pico della Mirandola, they had copies. Um, but now that doesn't mean that they accepted everything in the Picatrix at face value, but they they definitely recognized it. It was part of philosophy at the time. Um, I, I, as far as I'm aware, Ficino is the, the only author who comes anywhere close to praising it. Everyone else has bad things to say about it. Well, even Ficino doesn't really praise it. Well, yeah, but he, he never it. names it. And when he does, it's in a private letter. That's true. And he's recommending not to use it because he's saying everything that is of good and of worth, I've copy pasted it into my De Vita Libri Tres, which, and so all of the barbarous and idolatrous material, that stuff, I, you know, you don't need that stuff, so don't worry about it. It hasn't been transferred. It's funny you mentioned the the fact the warning is mentioned loads of times, though, because this is something that's come up with with John Michael Greer actually a couple of times, and I think um, I can see why when temperaments are different back, you know, way way back, that these warnings are going to be there. But nowadays, uh, you know, because people would say, well, hang on, now you you've taken this book which is warned against repeatedly, and you've published it literally. You know, you could just buy a copy and have it the next day, you know. And Greer always states that people forget that magic takes a lot of work. So my argument with the, the warning sign thing is that the kind of people who are going to be reading these books in that serious manner probably would have really tried to sort them out, like, you know, seek them out wherever anyway. So I think that warning thing is always a bit silly. Um, well, in, injunctions to secrecy are like the sine qua non of esotericism. Yeah. And the idea is if you were to just give something to somebody right away, they just wouldn't believe it or they wouldn't accept it because they haven't done any work to mm -hmm. acquire that knowledge. Well, but if you veil something in many veils, you increase the value of the thing at the end of the, at the end of the line. And that is really, I think the heart of esotericism. It is this, this constant seduction um, in order to, to, get people to desire to learn and to know. And with, uh, so I, I think it does seem a bit silly, but I think that it, it is a cornerstone of the genre is this initiatic character. That is what makes something hermetic. Hermeticism is the, the initiation between a master and a student. And it is that mode of discourse between, um, who is it, Tat and uh, yeah, Asclepius, or, series, yeah. yeah. Um, it's always this process of, of leading people through these veils because they wouldn't value it if you just gave it to them up front. Mm -hmm. And there's also the very practical side of the true hazards of some of the rituals here, wherein the ingredients involved, um, Scopolamine and company are truly hazardous. You really don't want to mess with this. And we actually include a warning in our own introduction that, uh, you know, the, there, a lot of it is sure to be unsafe. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that was Gerg one of Gurdjieff's clear points as well, is that you never, he made it clear to his followers that you never um, appreciate anything which is given to you and you haven't had to work for. Um, or pay money for it. He some was sense. Sorry? He was a real master of that uh, technique of setting up veils and, and, and creating kind of a depth where certainly there was one, but like that's part of the journey is, is the piercing through the veils. That's what I was going to say as well is the, the idea of a journey is like, you can only have the journey yourself. So any conclusions, sort of like someone who's had the experience of climbing to the top of the mountain if they just said to you or show, showed you a picture, said, here's the view, it's completely like never going to be the same thing as journeying up the mountain yourself. So I was, you know, I think the journey is the important thing. But as we're on the topic of warnings and danger, um, 
you know, this this book is under, still understood by many as, you know, you mentioned the Picatrix. People think of sort of uh, people in their basements clad in black robes, uh, stood on a pentagram, you know, the tomb of black magic. Is, is there, as we're speaking of warnings, is there any truth to this? Or is it, well, uh, I think is this come from all... a Christian sort of sensibility? It, well, right now, in today's day and age, certainly, like, Picatrix is just one more manual in magician's toolkits. So it depends what kind of magic you're into. If you're into Solomonic Goetia, or if you're into strictly just astral magic, it depends. You, you, you would have a collection of works that you would work with. And in that regard, in this day and age, it is definitely associated with this sort of post-Crowley um, golden dawnification of magic. Uh, but I think prior to, you know, if we're talking about the medieval ages, the people who were mostly looking at this stuff were clerics. Um, Christian clerics were the literate people, and the people who were involved in learned magic were literate people. And so that's how we know about these works. They survived because they were kept in monastery libraries, and sometimes they were excised and stuffed into other works in order to maybe defang them a little bit or um you know if you have this work on talismans and maybe it's stuffed in a book on astronomy then it might seem a little bit more neutral than if you just had this standalone work on talismans and there's i mean there's certain places that are known to have been hotbeds of interest in the esoterica in the middle ages saint augustine's monastery at canterbury comes to mind where a friend and colleague uh, of ours at uh, university of london uh, published a book uh, on exactly that place and the magical texts contained therein her name is sophie page and it, her book is in the magic and history series in fact yeah magic in the cloister that's the one and that library became john d's library his personal library um so that became the largest library in england for quite some time and yeah so there 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 was a, a negative association in the sense that there is some sort of flirtation with idolatry there is flirtation with you know you're dealing with body parts and dealing with um but also i think medieval people were probably a lot less squeamish than we are yeah. mm -hmm. the noxious substances yeah the, the hazardous materials that are that are especially plant matter yeah. that is to be burned in close quarters and inhaled and so on um you know eight ounces of opium is going to get you far right but in terms of the nefarious character right and the nefarious aesthetic of the picatrix it is both there and it is both not there it was not intended to be that way it was yeah. intended to be the height of religion and philosophy and science and it is in it in its received form that it's taken on this more uh, nefarious image. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not a majority of the rituals in the text that aim at harmful ends. Uh, it, it's a it's it, they are there somewhere between a quarter and a third um, of the rituals and the intent of the rituals uh, it aims for uh, at harm of some sort, uh, which means the majority of it is beneficial but the harmful aspects are present and they're undeniable yeah they're like destroying cities or yeah. ruining marriages or making this kind of thing. either people keeping people imprisoned or causing them to escape mm -hmm. is there any documentation of of people using this for you know malevolent aims or is there any is there any documentation of you know maybe there are Christians like Johannes Hartley decrying the use of the Picatrix, saying that, you know, it's bitter poisons mixed in with sweet words. And um, that there are other people like Rabelais saying, you know, he calls um, Picatrix the rector of the diabolical fac faculty. So we get a bunch of little references here even victor hugo um talks about uh, esmeralda's goat being uh, uh knowledgeable of mathematics like picatrix so you get these little hints that pop up and it, it's never really direct anything and i think that that also has to do with the fact that again picatrix is just one book and a magician would presumably have a collection of them 
Um, and there's no reason why you would single out Picatrix in your discussions of, of condemning a magician. Yeah, there's an, uh, a quote from 1897 by the Reverend J. Wood Brown saying that it's to be hoped that the Picatrix may never be translated into any modern language. Hmm. And I think a lot of this has to do with the cross-pollination with uh, Solomonic magic, right? Which it is it is not. It is not the, the same kind of demonic magic. Uh, there are many magicians today who mix the systems, but in origin, these are two very different traditions. Uh, it, could, could you differentiate them? Oh, sure. I mean, one is, is based on summoning, for example, the 72 Dukes of Hell or the, the, the Demons of Solomon. Um, and the, this is much later. Uh, this stuff comes much later than Picatrix by about 600 years, if I'm not mistaken. No, or as we heard the Hayat al-Hakim, for sure. Uh, yeah, exactly. Whereas one is dealing with celestial intelligences, which are spirits or ruhaniyat that are connected to the planets, which themselves, you know, they've got sight and and they have senses. They, it, it was debated among the philosophers of the Islamic world how many senses they had, but nonetheless, uh, they were sensate beings and they had retinues of spirits that accompanied them, and those could be placated to redirect the the, the rays that constitute the material world and various sacrifices and plants and uh you know when you sacrifice an animal or if you burn a plant you are releasing some of these rays or spirits back into the universal matrix of rays and thereby creating various configurations that alter reality and these are learned right these are things that are passed down from generation to generation through various ancient sages. And so the Picatrix is very much a collection of these things. And a lot of them are pseudepigraphically attributed. So you know, Plato did this teleportation ritual or walk on water or flight or something like that. Or, um, so it's, it's often pseudepigraphically attributed philosophers and who to us, not like to, to us, we don't think about these figures as being magicians, but certainly in the um, Arab world in the 10th century, they did. Okay. Okay. Um, one sort of big question for me is because I think a lot of magic, at least, well, definitely after Crowley, is understood in relation to the will. Um, you know, the, the, yes. the magician's will, the sorcerer's will, whatever it may be. Is there a different understanding of this within the Picatrix? No, the how? Picatrix, I think, is a real big part of this that has not been very much discussed. Mm -hmm. The will is very important, and explicitly so, in the Picatrix. That, you know, prayers and rituals and stuff like that, they don't work if you, if the will is not attendant on them. Yeah, the... the um... Doubt is antithetical to the success of these magical operations, and the Picatrix is explicit about saying so. Yes, and so the will is a is a big part of it. And then once once that goes into the Christian world, it certainly uh, upsets. And and I would say this is not just Picatrix. This would be a bunch of books like the Secret of Secrets as well. And what they do is they bring into question free will. If everything is astrally determined by these celestial intelligences, then what what purpose does free will have? And how, for example, do these celestial rays affect the development of things like religions? Are religions above celestial uh, influences or are they the product of them? Because Abu Mashar definitely a, a student of Al-Kindi definitely thought that they were but um, later on people like Roger Bacon they took up these ideas and and recapitulated them but Pico de la Mirandola in the Renaissance he vehemently denies this connection he says that you know magic has nothing or um, celestial influences from astrology have nothing to do with uh, 
religion and look at all of these astrologers predicting all of these things about religion and look their calculations are wrong and oh look they predicted that christianity would end in 1460 but here we are in for the 1490s um so there was definitely in the christian world uh the will became very important because the will is fundamental to Augustinian theology. It's, it's fundamental in the Neoplatonic cosmology, it's fundamental in Augustinian Catholicism, and therefore it becomes fundamental in the Latin West. And that really then gets carried on, you know, in through the Enlightenment and on into Crowley's day. And I, I think of Crowley very much as a, a theoretician of the will um, above all. Mm -hmm. And I think that Picatrix definitely played uh, a part in that story that, uh, that is not often praised. And that is probably in part because Picatrix was not known to Crowley. Um, it, he could not have known about it and it just had not been rediscovered yet. So the kind of magic that he was involved with, it was downstream from the peak tricks. Okay, that leads to the question then, is there a, is there a teleology of, for the practitioner of the peak tricks, or is this solely a handbook for sort of individual aims of, you know, the present, like what I need now, right? You know, I want to... So there is definitely a teleology. The whole book is called The Goal of the Sage. Mm -hmm. So like that, the tele the Aristotelian teleology is is fundamentally rooted into the whole structure of the system because you are supposed to become perfected in the seven liberal arts and then once you've accomplished that then you sort of break through into the ability to wield magic and once you can do that then you will perform your ritual of perfect nature and when you perform the ritual of the perfect nature you summon your higher genius, your, in Thelemic terms, your holy guardian, guardian angel, which is, you know, a later term, but that is more or less what it is. It is that platonic daimon or, or higher genius that you communicate with. And it is both you and it is both not you. And that is your perfect self, your perfect nature. And so the whole point of the Picatrix is to come into contact with your perfect nature and become a perfected human being like the ancient sages were. And only once you've achieved that can you achieve success in the rituals that accompany these theoretical expositions. Okay. So does it does it state whether or not it's bad to sort of use the Picatrix, you know, willy-nilly uh, without this sort of um, will Wait, towards well, yeah. perfection? If, if you if you try to operate without the proper preparation, your ritual simply won't work, mm -hmm. according to the matrix. Yeah. Unless you've achieved your perfect nature, um, the rest of it is uh, it will 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 arrive to naught. Yeah. And this became actually uh, debated later on in again the Christian world with a figure like Petrus Alfonsi, who wrote the. Disciplina Clericalis, where he's talking about various debates about the seven liberal arts and what is the highest liberal art. And he says, you know, some people think philosophy is the highest liberal art, but then others who are wicked people, hmm. they think that nigromancia is the highest liberal art. And that is very much the Spanish term for uh, black magic or astral magic in this case. Okay, so what, what are the preparations? So, well, there are many, and often they involve purification, um, like not having any dirt on your clothes kind of purification, mm -hmm. because presumably that, you know, if if one kind of metal or stone is, is um, favorable to the planet that you are conjuring, then you don't want to have dust on you, which could have particles of the of antithetical stones, of antithetical um, substances. So you make sure that you are ritually purified. You have to select the right hours. That's really the the core of it. So you know, knowledge in astrology is it, the 
sine qua sine non qua. of the whole operation. You just can't do anything without calculating the right astrological hours. And, uh, and then usually there are instructions for any given spell. And they involve the construction of talismans or making of images, and then sometimes putting those images places, uh, or sometimes suffumigating those images while they hang on a, on a tin cross. So there's one example of that. Um, there, and then there are, so those are the talismanic operations, but then there are also the invocatory uh, addressative type operations, which are not real, uh, like some, I think some people nowadays, they mix them together into one thing. Um, but in the Picatrix, they seem to be kind of separate where the invoking of the planetary intelligences, uh, like the spirit of Saturn or the spirit of Jupiter, that stuff is its own um, kind of magic. And that is more like, this is what the ancient pagans or ancient sages used to do. And I, myself, Al Kortubi, I don't recommend that you do this. I merely pass it along because this is what the ancient sages would do. But he definitely recommends you do talismanic astro magic. Yeah. Uh, some other aspects of purity that are involved. Uh, sometimes we see injunctions to, for fasting as well as for sexual purity. So abstain, abstaining from sexual activity in a certain period prior to the, to uh, producing the ritual. Yeah. The, everything is very contingent on specific rituals. Yeah. It's, th there isn't really like a one size fits all um, way of getting prepared for an operation. It seems that different spells require different components and they, they there's not like a blanket um, uh, prepare, preparation system. Okay. Do you, do you, uh, is there any, would you say there's any contemporary equivalence to the Picatrix? I mean, I would think uh, much, when I was reading it, um, much of it actually reminded me of Manly P. Hall's The Secret Teachings of All Ages, except Manly P. Hall basically cites nothing at all. Um, do, you, do you think there's any contemporary sort of attempts to recreate something along these lines? Well, uh, having pulled together the index to the Picatrix, I can say that it felt a lot like trying to index the, the famous uh, cookbook, The Joy of Cooking, especially the earlier editions that have extensive discussions of the background to cooking, which is the butchering of the animal and the preparation of the meat and this kind of thing. Uh, as a sort of metaphor for what the Picatrix does in terms of astral magic, where you, you have bits of theory that then are followed by a bunch of recipes that that include a huge variety of ingredients and so on. So the, the you know in terms of of structure and layout, it, it's most reminiscent to me of the joy of cooking. But <laughs> concept that's a different story. Okay, okay. Um, so we're in we're in to about an hour now. Is there anything sort of you know, as two people on on Earth who've probably spent more time with this book than basically most people ever will, is there anything um, you'd like to add in that you you think is commonly missed out in such conversations as these about about the peak trips? Hmm. I know that's like a, a I know that's a huge question because I'm sure there's there's a lot we've sort of missed out, but. Well, we, we've touched on quite a bit in this in, in this discussion, I would say, in terms of uh, the warnings about the toxicity of and, and potential hazards associated with some of the rituals for very practical and and uh, and verifiable reasons. Um, henbane and hemlock are toxic, and there are multiple rituals that call for both. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other of other uh, yeah, lead and lead and so on and... neurologically active ingredients in this that are to be manipulated. Uh, that uh, unless there it's done very very carefully, and unless you have the right background knowledge to know this, it will be hazardous. It will cause harm, probably to yourself in the manipulation, um, and possibly to anyone around you, because not not all the rituals are uh, solitary in this text. There's a handful of the one that ones that require other people. So, Dan, I don't know if you had anything to add. Yeah, I don't know. It is a bit of a broad question, so it's difficult for me to think off the cuff. I guess the, the, the awareness of the multiple steps in producing this text is helpful in terms of uh, 
sort of a general warning of not taking it as an absolute, that what is in anyone's hands when they have uh, our translation of the Picatrix is the result of, of many, many, of the text going through many, many hands and many, many minds before reaching uh, this stage. And one could take any, any given chunk of it and trace it backward through, uh, from our text to Pingree's edition, to the various manuscripts that he used, to the tra original translators in the late 13th century, to the translator of the Spanish version, and then all the way back to uh, Al-Qurtubi himself and the various manuscripts of the Arabic in the meantime too. So uh, that not, not to treat it as a sacred text, and in fact, what I'm saying applies as opposed to all texts that date back multiple centuries because they all go through a similar kind of process. This one more than others, to be fair, because of the multilingual stages that it went through. Yeah, I think I, I do know what something to take away is, is that Picatrix is a chapter in the history of science. It is a chapter in the history of medicine, and it is a chapter in the history of philosophy at just as much as it is a chapter in the history of magic and um you know often it's called the hermetic work and that is true to some extent but it is just as hermetic as it is aristotelian as it is platonic as it is jabirian as it is ibn Wushian. so it, it, these kinds of categories don't help much but it's important to think about how systems of knowledge were developed over centuries and how different ideas about science and what science was meant for and what was the, the driving goal of science, uh, these kinds of things um, have changed significantly. And I think it's important to keep in mind that it has not always been this way. And a book like Picatrix really is like a paradigm shift. It really helps you think about how different the paradigm you live in now is from, from the one in the ninth century. It's a very good point there. Different, and, and it's from a different paradigm and you sort of have to mentally put yourself within that different paradigm in order to understand truly what's going on in the Picatrix, as well as any other books of its, uh, within its genre. Yeah, and of course there are things to learn from that paradigm, right? It's not just this, this objective anthropologist kind of attitude. There are things I think that science in our day and age, um, there are elements of science in our day and age that I think are severely lacking, where I think in the 10th century, they had a much, much more holistic picture of, of what science was for. I think that seems to be uh, sort of a good place to finish up. Do, do you, Are you planning on doing another translation together or are either of you working on something you know something at the moment a book or a blog or anything along these lines we, we happen to have finished one very recently we've uh, decided to well we got a third party on board a uh, friend and colleague brett bartlett and we've collectively translated Basilio Ficino's de cristiana religione uh, on the christian religion uh we started on uh january 2nd this year and submitted to the press on november 2nd um and it worked every day pretty much worked just about every day on it uh online and so that's now also off of our desk and and off to the reviewers um and we're hoping to collaborate further on some other things in the future either along the lines of ficino's uh polemical text or along the lines of the picatrix where uh al kindi's book on rays uh is short and sweet and may and is on the list certainly for uh, for translation. Part of it's been translated already by Peter Adamson and others in a collection of Alkindi's philosophical works, but he didn't do the whole thing. Precisely those bits that are consonant with the Picatrix, he didn't translate, and so that would be a decent target of, for a, a modest sized project that would uh, that would be useful, I think. Yeah, it'd be a pretty brief project. Exactly. Yeah. But uh, yeah, there are other things that I've been looking at and yeah. juggling, but the problem is that all of the things that I'm interested in right now are massive they're like a thousand page kabbalistic commentaries on say pico de la mirandola's kabbalah and like 
doing a translation of Pico in and of itself is a monumental task, but then doing a translation of his commentators is is even crazier. I saw somebody did an edition of uh, Giorgio, uh, no, who is it? Um, Francesco Giorgi's uh, Harmony of the World on the Harmony of the World, and it is a thousand pages. Of early printed edition text. Yeah, and so somebody recently did an Italian and Latin facing editions. And um, so that, that work is a, written by a Franciscan who was working with uh, Pico de la Mirandola's Kabbalistic conclusions and created a whole system of the world basically. And it's a thousand pages. So th that's the kind of stuff that I'm interested in right now. And in a way that is a very anti Picatrixian current um, Kabbalah, very much consciously set itself against astrological magic and saw itself as a totally different um, way of, of knowing and, and approaching the divine and so forth. And so they were very much at odds. And, and some of the works that I'm looking at in my dissertation, like Pico de la Mirandola's Heptapolis, these are, they're anti-astrological. And, and they are very much, they say things like, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't make images uh, or, or we should meld our souls or, or like melt our souls into the shape of Christ and, and get rid of all these talismans because we have the, the prince of talismans or like the, the ultimate talisman who is Christ. And that becomes a very, you might say, uh, fundamentalist movement insofar as it culminates in figures like Savonarola, who create these um, theocracies that burn books like Picatrix, burn works of art, um, very iconoclastic way of thinking. Uh, but that's a, that's a whole other story. Um, but that's kind of what I'm interested in. So I, I, we've been floating around these two sort of currents, these, these very uh, esoteric Christians, you might say, Renaissance Christians who certainly read and were involved with things like the Picatrix, but who themselves practiced a more exclusively um, pseudo Dionysian, uh, exclusively Christian form of mysticism rather than magic. There seems to be a massive resurgence of, of uh, you, you mentioned Facino. There seems to be, he's, uh, he's making a comeback, it seems. Yes, I, I, think that the, there have been a handful of translations of his works recently. Uh, the Platonic Theology was translated by uh, Allen and Hankins. And then we have the Three Books on Life, which was translated by Cask and Clark. And um, his, his letters uh, have been the target of a tra long term translation project at uh, the London School of Economics, of all places, uh, <laughs> where they have 10, uh, 10 volumes out at this point, And there is only one left to do. Yeah, wow. so all these English translations are all sort of culminating and coming together. And uh, a big part of it was also Francis Yates, uh, Dame Francis Yates, who wrote the Giordano Bruno and the Hermetic Tradition. She really um, sold Ficino as this kind of magus, and that really got people interested in Ficino as a magician, um, which that's really only one facet of his identity. Uh, and then... Also, you know, all of these translations coming together and interest in astral magic and in astrology, that's really, you know, the, the renaissance of astrology is brand new. That's like within the last decade or so. And so people who are interested in traditional astrology have been reading a lot of Ficino and, uh, and yeah, we are getting into his polemical side where he's drawing from these mendicant ex or converso Jews who um, turn around and basically write against Jews. And so this is Ficino's anti-Islamic, anti-Jewish, pro-Christian polemic. And he's basically carving out his identity by slamming on Jews. And, and that's his modus operandi in this particular work. Part of our aim is to correct the, the over-lionization of Marsilio Ficino as this Renaissance luminary 
uh, at the expense of the whole person who is also this harsh anti-Semite, well within the Catholic tradition of his time. Right. Though the, the question of anti-Semitism is a tricky one because yes. it's like philo-Semitism and anti-Semitism are blurred together in some ways where it's like you want to learn Jewish knowledge and Hebrew knowledge and you want to learn from them, but you also want to learn it from them so that you can turn it around and use it against them. And that is really the dominant motif that begins with the mendicants um, especially figures like Raymond Marti in the in Spain around the time that the Picatrix was written, actually. Uh, and these were uh, monks who dedicated their lives to trying to convert Jews. And many con uh, converted Jews became these Dominican monks and then turned around and um, persecuted and tried to uh, force conversions. And so... Marsilio Ficino, often touted as this humanist, whatever humanist means, right? Everybody's got their own idiosyncratic definition of what humanism means. We also have this figure who was very medieval in his outlook. And so human, humanism is a defining feature of this Renaissance period. But uh, there was as much continuity with the Middle Ages and some of its attitudes as there was change in a figure like Ficino. And I think a lot of the recent stuff has emphasized his his change at the expense of the continuity with the Middle Ages. And so we're really trying to shed a, a light on that. Yeah. Wow. There's a there's a lot going on in um in is it how do you is it classified as just classical studies or medieval studies? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> because it spans both. I mean Piccino is reaching back way into uh, the rabbinic tradition of the first couple of centuries AD. Uh, the Picatrix reaches back quite far as well in terms of its source material, uh, having been written in the 10th century itself. So we're, I guess our own work is emphasizing the continuity yeah. in all of this. But, but for example, doctor, you, you work in a classics department, yeah. but you're the chair of the medieval department. Program. Yeah, program. I'm in a history department. Um, but my, my graduate degree or my MA is in classics. Um, so really it's kind of all just mushed together. It's a bit of both. It's classics, it's history, it's medieval studies, it's Renaissance studies, and it's also religious studies and philosophy. All of it pre-modern though. That's yes. the, that's the, uh, yeah. that's the key thing. Um, so I mean, for example, next term I'm teaching a class on introduction to medieval studies and, uh, ancient Greco-Roman religions. So... Um, I suppose I should add, um, whereabouts can we pick up uh, the Picatrix, even though we shouldn't, totally shouldn't fall into the hands of the wrong people? Uh, where can we quickly buy it? I'm pretty sure that Penn State University Press would be very happy for you to order it directly from them in order to avoid the profits of intermediation. But it's also available in all the, all the places you would expect it to be. But if you want to accelerate the collapse of society then go and buy it on Amazon so that we can concentrate the wealth and then eventually we can, you, we can take it over. Okay. Um, yeah, on that note, uh, Dan and David, thanks very much. You're very welcome. Thanks for having us, James. It's been a pleasure.